that I wanted to start with, and then I took my finger off. It's in John, chapter 3. I wanted to start here this morning. I'm glad that you all came back. You know, last week I, I wasn't sure just whether you were going to come back or not, considering how rough I was. Um, but uh, you came back, so I'll go ahead and let you have it a little bit more now. Um, that was with regards to me calling somebody a coward and a traitor. Um, I'll explain that in just a moment. In, uh, in John chapter 3, when Jesus, when Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, uh, he said something there that you know just really got my attention when I first read it. And it took a number of years before I, um, I got a suspicion as far as just what he was really saying. I'm going to start out in verse 3, where, uh, where Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, there's a lot to this, this question. I did a 30-minute program on this. Uh, Nicodemus, born again, again. And then a follow-up to that, uh, Nicodemus, the stealth believer. You know, and so, uh, please take the time to, to listen to that. But, uh, but I don't want to talk about uh, the six different ways you can be born again this morning. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now that really grabbed my attention when he said, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things or the things of heaven? Because to me, he just said something that would, I would expect to be of the things of heaven. You know, being born again, being born again by the Spirit, and the Spirit comes. And You know, I, I, I had a hard time fitting that in the category uh, of earthly things for a little while. Uh, and it is heavenly, and just give me a chance you know, to, to explain more. But my initial thought was, was that he was talking about that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that's the, that's the uh, um, earthly thing, and then that which is of the spirit is spirit, and that's the heavenly thing. And, and so if he says, well, I'm going to tell you about heavenly things, and you're not going to believe, and where's the, it just got me all distracted. And it's just because of my personality, I guess, and so I have some patience with it. Okay. So I looked at that and I thought, you know, this just seems a little bit awkward. Where is the heavenly? Where is the earthly? And what is he really, what is he really getting at? Well, what really got my attention later on was to realize that to talk about salvation and the things of the Spirit, that really is kind of an earthly thing. You know, I mean, in heaven, I don't think people are going to be born again. I mean, once you're there, you're there. So in a, in a certain way, in a certain sense, the subject of the gospel, the restoration of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, all of that, that is kind of an earthly thing. You know, it just took me a little while to, to, to put it in that context, just because when we enter into his kingdom, then then we're there. You know? But what he says here in the context of you uh, you're not believing me or hearing about the things that I'm telling you and understanding the, the earthly things, and so how will you understand the heavenly things? That there's a there's a priority scale, in a sense, that if you're not going to understand the earthly things, it's unlikely you're going to understand the heavenly things, and so you better understand the earthly things first, so that you can understand the heavenly things, otherwise it's just not going to, it's not likely that it's going to happen. Now sometimes I've used this in order to, to justify talking about earthly things, like last week I spent a lot of time talking about money, you know, where I explained that money is silver, uh, it's also gold, but for the most part throughout history, it's been silver more than gold. And I, and I spent a lot of time talking about money in that context and the devaluation of currencies and those kinds of things. And I could say that, that that's the earthly thing in order to understand the spiritual and heavenly thing. Right? 
Oh, that's your phone. <laughs> See, I have to say that because the, you know the camera is right there, and it'll it'll pick up on that. That's okay. Um, it, you know, it's live. <laughs> um, I uh, so you've got the, the you've got the, uh, the 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 physical aspect of the money that I talked about. Then I gave you the spiritual revelation from there, and you might think, well, there's the earthly thing, and then there's the heavenly thing. You know, the spiritual truth, but. You know, in a lot of ways, most of what we have here in the context of the earth and the spirit in our life in Christ, I think most of it still kind of fits in the category of earthly things, only because I, I think a lot of it will, in, in some ways, become obsolete when we enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, there'll be a lot of things that will be obsolete. Our flesh will be obsolete. And, you know, the, the, the life that we live and the struggles that we have, most of those will become obsolete. Sometimes this is described as a refinement that takes place, and I'll show you uh, more about that a little bit later. But that's what I wanted to talk about just to get started with, is that there, there is some significant importance, there's a lot of importance, in understanding the earthly things. You know, when I talked about money last week, what I was really wanting to get to was the spiritual issues. But you know, there are a lot of people who just don't take money seriously. You know, they just don't. They don't take it seriously at all. The devaluation that's taking place with the monetary system that's, that's being used in the whole world right now is a serious matter, and people just don't want it to be a, an issue, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe because, you know, this is one of the things I find. You know, there are a lot of people who either don't care or they don't want to care because they benefit from it. All right, they benefit from it a lot. People, and if you if you hit the big red button, you know, like I explained last week, you know, there's going to be a lot of change, and people aren't going to want that kind of change. There's no hope there for for a lot of folks, and so it's so that you have this majority who don't want to have any interest in it and want to keep everything secret and and want to hide because they benefit from it for the most part, and because of this deep desire that we have that God created within us to be accepted. You know, we have this deep need to be to be accepted, a need for acceptance. You know, when you take a position or believe something that is contrary to the majority, it, it really goes against this deep need that you have for acceptance. All right? I mean, it's, it's a serious obstacle because you're going to reduce the pool of people or the number of people. You're going to reduce the, the collection of people who will likely accept you just by taking a position like that. And, and I think that there are a lot of people who really do struggle with this. You know, who, who really struggle with this. That they will do everything possible not to go there, not to think about these things, not to consider, and not to even speak about these things. Because of the risk that they will get a tremendous amount of rejection from so many people. And there'll be a lot of people who just won't want to have anything to do with them, won't like them, won't this, won't that. I mean, you really have to have a tremendous amount of fortitude in many ways, to take a position like I did last week when it comes to money. You know, to say that this is money and this is not, and that this is criminal and this is not, that kind of thing. I mean, it really requires a lot within a person to be willing to give up on all these opportunities to be liked by other people in order to take a position like that. But it, I just, I don't know, I don't know um, how a person can really embrace <clears throat> the seriousness the significance of devaluing the Word of God until they can embrace something like that. You know, because that's what goes on. There's a major devaluation in the Word of God that is just simply not being used for the purpose that God gave it, and it's being diminished, and it's being misapplied and misused in so many different ways that it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, I gave the example last week when it comes to uh, legalism. To, you know, I, I, I hate to use that word only because it's, it, the definition varies depending upon who's using it. Um, but uh, I'm going to use that word with the definition that if somebody lives their life trying to restrain their flesh, then that's legalism. All right. Now, I don't mean that a person should then live their life to indulge their flesh either. There is a third way of life that has nothing to do with that, and that's that's what I want to direct people to. There's a life of either the restraint of the flesh, which is found in religion, 
and the life of the indulgence of the flesh, which is found in the world. And, and then there's a third way of life, which has to do with trust and reliance on the Lord, what He has accomplished and what He is doing, and on who He is. And that's, that's, that, that's uh, um, on the basis of the New Covenant. But there is a, a major devaluation that takes place when people teach the law, when they teach living a life of restraint of the flesh, okay, which is a life of religion. And the definition of that word is a system of bondage. Right? And the bondage, the idea of the bondage and the purpose of it is to, is to restrain the flesh, put the flesh into bonds, to keep it from sinning, that kind of thing. But in order to do that, you must have law. And usually you've got, to have, you've got to have a lot of it. And what I was explaining last week is that we are surrounded by people who teach and believe that that's the Christian life. That the Christian life has something to do with identifying the list of rules, regulations, principles to live by, laws that's going to govern our life. And then they teach that or they believe that, they live their lives accordingly, only to discover that they will fail. Right? They fail. Because we just simply cannot obey all of the commandments of God. So what do you do when you fail? Well, that's, that's when you call on some grace. All right? That's when you call on some Jesus. You know, you need some Jesus in your life for when you fall short in your obedience to His commandments. That's how people will uh, apply forgiveness, how they will apply grace. But by doing that, they devalue the law. Okay? They, they diminish the law. They, 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 they dilute the, the law, like the diluting of the alcohol that I explained last week. And there's a lot of people who ask me questions about what kind of alcohol that was, even. <laughs> you know, it wasn't wine. It's not strong drink, I checked. It's, 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 you know, it, it might be better classified as beer. I, I don't know. I don't have the recipe for that. <laughs> I don't have the recipe, so I can't tell you exactly what kind of an alcohol it was. But he was talking about it being diluted. That was the importance. That the, that the silver was being diluted with the dross, with the other metals that, that you would expect to be taken out of it. They were devaluing their currency and using that in trade. And as a consequence, their alcohol that they were using to get drunk with was being diluted with water and so they had to drink a whole bunch more to fill themselves in order to get the same effect they were trying to achieve. It's the dilution. And there is a dilution that happens in the law when people use grace. Right? Have you ever felt like you were really struggling with someone, talking with them about the differences between law and grace and the implications of forgiveness, and you feel like you're just trying to give them some grace, you know? You know, you're just trying to give it to them and trying to get them to take it. Have you ever gotten that sense? And they just won't do it. Let me give you an idea, right? Try not doing that. Try taking it away from them. Okay, you shouldn't be giving them more grace. You should be taking whatever they've got out of their life. Because what you're doing is you're diluting the effect of the law. Okay, sometimes people come to me and they say, I just can't figure out how, you know, this person has gone into this legalistic pit of some kind. You know, they're embracing the law, and even very overtly and aggressively, we've got this messianic movement, for example, where people just, you know, they just say, we must live by Torah. So, you know, remember a few weeks ago when I spoke, we got that, you know, on a recording where I, I read the verse that was written in very small words, easy to understand, from Deuteronomy 28, that all of the plagues that are not listed in here will come upon you. All right, very small words, easy to understand where Torah was used, you know. And people would get into this, and then, you know, you, you talk to them and say, oh, no, you know, Jesus doesn't hold your sins against you anymore. You know, He doesn't look at you in the midst of your sinful. He forgave you. He set you free from the law. There's a newness of life to walk in. And they, and they, they, they say that you're, you're diluting, you know, uh, things, or that you're not really taking God seriously. And it's they who are not taking God seriously. And you've got to twist those tables around, or tw you know, twist this argument around to where it needs to be and take the grace out of their life. All right? Get it, don't give them anymore. Take it away from them. Because it is a dilution that needs to be removed. All right? You've heard people say things like, we've got to find ourselves a healthy, well-balanced church. Right? There's a real popular radio teacher. I love this guy. He's a great guy. You know, I, I haven't listened to him for a long time. Um, called the, the Bible Answer Man. I think he's great, especially because uh, the comment that he had about me. 
somebody called and asked him about me and my position on the Trinity, gave him my explanation, and his answer was, oh, this is an easy one to answer. That cannot be possible. That, is, that, is to be, that, that position is to be totally rejected because it's understandable. <laughs> right? I mean, he's the healthy, well-balanced church guy. And what he means by that is he means you need to have a good balance between law and grace. Right, you got to have a good balance. you got to have some law. you got to have some grace. Okay? And to me, the healthy balance is the absolute epitome of defilement when it comes to law and grace. 50-50? You know, no. It's either 100 or 100. I mean, you, get, you really got to take your position, and he's the ultimate of in the middle of the road. Or on the fence. You know, that kind of a thing. So, when you're dealing with someone who wants the law, and they won't take grace, I'm talking about someone who's rejecting the grace of God, then don't let them have it. Right? Give them the law. You know, they want it, give it to them. And give it to them good. All right? I mean, really give it to them. Call them on Saturday and ask them, are you thinking about mowing your lawn? <laughs> what about that laundry that you've got that's piling up on you? You know, I, I'm just, I just want to make sure you're not being tempted to do any work on the Sabbath. Because you know that's one of the big ten. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have a bacon double cheeseburger recently? You know, I, you need an accountability partner in your life. You know, I'll do that for you. You know, and I'll I'll check up on you every other day or two and see how you're doing with your sin. You know, I mean, really, just you know, get some good law in their life. Take all the strip all the grace out of them as you possibly can, so that they can have pure old covenant. They can have it. And then it will begin to have its perfect work. But the more grace you give them, the more ways out you give them. You know, you give a way out. And they shouldn't have a way out. That dilutes the law. It dilutes the commandments. Now, I can have some sympathy and some tolerance for people of this, with this struggle. I can. I can have some tolerance for that. Because I understand the sincerity required. And I remember having the same struggle myself. Right? And so I, you know, I personally, you know, have, uh, can find it um, easy to tolerate that and to, to help people walk through that. I don't have a problem with that, you know, because I understand the struggle that happens, and it, I think it's a really important struggle for people to go through, and that you usually have to have a lot of sincerity and a lot of devotion to to, to live that way. But then I explained to you last week, you know, something even more serious. And that's when a grace teacher starts adding law. Now that, to me, is a whole different story, but it's another, it's another kind of dilution. And this, to me, and I use the word traitorous, right? And I'll use the word again, <coughs> coward. I mean, you've got to be an absolute coward and a traitor to be someone who knows the grace of God and start to throw a little law in there. And this is happening, and this is really getting on my nerves because it's still going on. There's this, there's, there's this grace teacher right now I know of. I hate to date this, you know, this, but but that's what he's doing. He's been doing it for for a long time, and I've been watching carefully, and I've been trying to, you know, I've been patient, all right. But it's just not going away. You know, he's using guilt and shame in order to get people to give him money, and he's and he's using. He's using the law, you know, in, in the sense of you're not a mature Christian. You know, you're not this. You're, you're this. You're, you're not meeting the expectations of God. or You're just not reaching out there. But don't worry. I am here in order to help you be holy. Give me your money and I will sanctify it. Kind of BS. <laughs> all right. And, and, and this I do not have any tolerance for at all. All right, I just, I just don't. If other people do, God bless you. All right, but I don't. When I see a grace teacher starting to dilute the message with law, or what's even nastier is, is to speak with ambiguous words. Ambiguous words. So that, you know, one person hears what he says and says, oh, he's, yeah, he's teaching the same thing we are. And another person hears what he says and says, you know, I think I know what you really believe and that it isn't what this guy over here says you believe, but you just said it with such soft, meaningless words 
that it's now ambiguous and so two different groups of people who believe things that are totally, completely opposed to one another, completely opposed, will embrace what you have said and we can now have unity. And that to me is just, it's, it's an abomination. It's an absolute abomination before God and I just don't have any tolerance for that. So, when it comes to dilution and devaluing, and when you add a little grace to law, I can get through it. But when you add law to grace, I, I, don't, I don't tolerate that. I, I, I personally can't. So pray for me <laughs> as I struggle with this frustration that I'm coping with at the moment. So anyway, I handed out the new verses for this week. <laughs> Told you all that in order to tell you this. Uh, because if you read through, uh, if you read through, we're in uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25. It is a continuation of the previous verses. Um, in, uh, in, in verse, uh, I'm going to read from the New King James Version just to get a little bit of a warm up here. Uh, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 24, he says, Therefore the Lord of hosts, the Lord of, I'm sorry, therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, that's a better translation of that, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. And I explained last week that if, that uh, this is in the uh, past tense, it's not in the future. Um, the translators would write things in the uh, in a different tense, for future, past, or complete or incompleted, because it would make more sense from a certain point of view. Uh, I'm going to translate things the way they really are and allow you to understand the other point of view, okay, which I believe he was intending. Uh, but beginning in verse 25, which is where I'm going to start out this week, I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. Again, he's talking about uh, the silver, referring to verse 22, uh, the silver that became dross, that was mixed with dross, uh, and uh, the wine mixed with water, in this case it's alcohol, we have another word for wine, that didn't use that word there in verse 22. Uh, but uh, I will take away all your alloy. In verse 26, I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice, and her penitents with righteousness. I'm going to pause there. There's some future uh, tense words here. He's talking about things that are going to happen in the future. And there is truth to that. That's true. These things had not yet been accomplished from one point of view. And so they've translated this in the future tense. But if you look at the translation that I've written, you're going to see that it's written in the past tense. A number of the words are written in the past tense. And that's not a mistake. They really are uh, written in the past tense. And the reason why I believe God spoke in this way was to say that this is something that is inevitable. It hasn't quite happened yet, but it is inevitable. It is something that is going to happen, and so we might as well talk about it as if it has already been accomplished. And then I'll point out where he does use a future tense word in order to uh, express that even though it is inevitable, it is still going to happen and there will be a future result. And that has to do with the return of the people who will be redeemed. Because here, here he says in verse, what is it, 27? Yeah, uh, no, 20, uh, 27. Yeah, and her penitence with righteousness. Talking about people, if they will be penitent, if they will bend the knee, if they will repent. That kind of an idea that is here in the New King James Version. That if they will do that, then they will be redeemed. And this is where you can get your, your, your sermons, you know, from, from that, you know, you all just need to obey and repent and be penitent and then you'll be redeemed and then everything will be just fine. But that's not what he says. He just says that those who will return will be redeemed. Those who, re, who, who return. And it could mean return to the Lord. That's true. But I think that there are other ways that it could have been written in order to exaggerate this point. In my opinion, what he's saying is, is that he's going to kill lots of people. And those who come back will be the redeemed. Those who stay, those who are alive. <laughs> whether, they, whether they repented or not really wouldn't be the issue. The issue is, is that he's making... Um, uh, 
He's taking a position and he's going to invoke some serious destruction in the land. You know, it's really simple. With God in the covenant, it's really simple. If you do what he tells you, he won't kill you. If you don't do what he tells, what he tells you to do, he will kill you or he will send somebody else to kill you. All right. In this case, he's saying, and if you make it, you'll be redeemed. If you're one of those who survived the killings. All right, that's the better, better expression of what he's written there. All right, so I just wanted to point out those minor little things there before I proceed into my translation that I've, that I've uh, uh, passed out. And if you do not have a copy, please uh, you know, raise your hand or something so that somebody can throw one at you, you know, maybe fold it up into a little or a point or something. Okay, we're all right. Uh, I'm gonna, now, I've got two, uh, two versions here. I've got a word for word and a thought for thought. And uh, the word for word will give you a, a better idea of the transition that I went through in order to get to the word for, in, in, to get to the thought for thought. Uh, but that's what I'm really going to read from because that's my intent right now. Beginning in verse 25 in that second paragraph, and I turned my hand against you, and I refined that which is separated from impurities, your drosses. In other words, he turned his hand against them, and he did a refinement. He, this is something that is an accomplished fact, and yet only in the sense that it's inevitable. All right, This is an inevitable refinement. <clears throat> and I turned my hand against you, and I refined that which is separated from impurities, and, and it, it is to say that is your drosses, which are the impurities that were separated. Now, he's not talking about stripping people of their mineral content if they have a good diet. You know, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the sin in their life, right? He's going to strip that out through, uh, uh, through the uh, re refining that he's going to do. Uh, and I removed all of your tin. Then in verse 26, And I returned your judges as in the time the nation was created, and your counselors as in the time they were first established. Well, you, know, you can look at the history and you can ask, all right, so when did that happen? You know, it hasn't quite happened yet, which is why I believe the translations that we have are written in the future tense, because the translators would read this and say, you know, Lord, it doesn't look like you did that yet. So let's put this in the future tense in order to give them a way, you know, give them a, a way out. Okay, because this had not yet happened, but he did write it in the... In the in, in the completed in the completed uh, tense of these verbs, so I believe that this is a statement of inevitability is what he's expressing here. That from his point of view, this is an inevitable fact, and so we might as well speak of it as something that uh, has already happened. Now, it's my opinion that this is something that was fulfilled when the people returned from captivity that they're about to go into. When they returned from captivity. Then, then there was a reestablishment of the nation. You know, the courts were reestablished. People used the law in order to judge matters. Judges were established. Counselors were established. This is actually a quotation from Isaiah. It's a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 1. When Moses was speaking to the nation of Israel about the judges that he established, this is Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 19 through 18. Those of you who are making notes, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verses 19 through 18. The words that Isaiah chose to use are words that, came, that, that come from this section in Deuteronomy when Moses was speaking about the judges that were established to help him judge cases. And so it's a partial quotation from the law that he's invoking here in order to express an accomplished fact that things will be reestablished to a way or in a similar way that the nation was originally established, which is why I've <coughs> written it in that way. <clears throat> but again, what's the, you know, what's the point when it's not going to work out? Well, it, that is the point, to show that it isn't going to work out. Right? The Lord is answering the question, do we live according to the knowledge of good and evil or not? Do we live according to the law or not? Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? <coughs> Remember, that was, that was the law that caused the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. Remember that? This is important. Okay, don't don't go to sleep on me yet. I'm not deviating. I, I really I'm not going down a rabbit trail. This is this is part of what I'm going to talk about next. All right. People think I you know, always deviate or something. Now listen, it was the Garden of Eden, right? And the, and the devil came by and he says, 
And he says, uh, you know, if you only know what is good and evil, then you can be like God. If you only know what is right and wrong, if you only know the law effectively, then you can be like God. And you don't have to be in this garden. We'll go out and start our own if that's going to be the case. And that's what happened. They go out and they start their own gardens. Got some weeds to pull, but they can start their own gardens and their own lives out there living according to the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord is providing them with His contribution to this great effort of living according to the knowledge of good and evil by giving them a, cl a clear description. The law through Moses, the knowledge of good and evil. Here you go, give it a try. And we'll do it again and again and again. And, and as many times as it takes <clears throat> until the Lord feels satisfied that He has given plenty of opportunity, plenty of clear examples to show that the lie of the devil that you can live according to the knowledge of good and evil is just that. It is a lie. So that we may be called to him to a new covenant and a different way of life entirely. So that's what, that's what we're right in the middle of. He says, I will establish the judges and the counselors. He's talking about when he's going to do it again, which happens when they return from captivity. And then they got removed again after the Lord Jesus came. The people have returned to the land, and I'm waiting to see to what degree they will reestablish that. This may be another try. Right? When the temple gets instituted and the Sanhedrin is given authority from a religious point of view again, maybe this will be another attempt. Let's see if you can really do it now. And I, I have a suspicion of that that will be the case. But as far as I'm concerned, God settled the issue through the Messiah when the Messiah came thousands of years ago. But there really is no real need to do that again. But to do that again, I suppose, is worthwhile. Uh, where was I? Verse 26. <clears throat> so, uh, the counselors, as in the time they were first established. After this, he will call out to you the fortified dwelling place of righteousness. Now, this is in the middle of what I have here in verse 26. Uh, after this, he will call out to you. Now, this is a way of him making a declaration to someone. It's like he's naming someone. He's calling out to them and saying, this is who you are. Very similar to when he called out to uh, uh, the heavens and said, heavens, and the earth. And he said, earth. You know, it's sort of like that. All right. he's, he's, he's naming these people and saying that they are an open, I'm sorry, saying that they are a fortified dwelling place of righteousness. If you look at my word-for-word -word translation later on, uh, you'll see that I use the word city twice. And there are two different words that are used there. Uh, the first word for city is a city that is a fortification. The kind of place where you would uh, uh, feel safe. The kind of place of a place of safety where justice is invoked. You know, in the event that somebody violates the law, there is enforcement power that will deal with it. The second word describes a city that would be open, but highly populated. Open and highly populated that does not necessarily have the same fortifications that would protect the people from an outside struggle or from an inside struggle, but that there's just simply a lot of people there. And so that's why I uh, uh, exaggerated a little bit more in the thought for thought translation that I have here that there is a fortified, he will call out to them and as if he is declaring to them that there is a fortified dwelling place of righteousness and open dwelling place with numerous faithful people. Right? Place of righteousness and a place of faithfulness. In verse 27, Zion will be redeemed in judgment and those of her who return in righteousness. And what this means is, is that those of her who return in righteousness will be redeemed in judgment. Again, those who return will be redeemed in judgment. The location, Zion, referring to the geography of Jerusalem, will be redeemed through the wiping out of whoever is there. All right? We're just going to kill everyone. And that will bring redemption to the geography. Cleanse the land. All right, remove everyone who shouldn't be there. Get them out of there. And then those who return in righteousness will be those who are returning with the attitude, with the, with the penitent or repentant heart per se, 
But those who, whether they are or not, those who return with at least a, 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 an intent, perhaps, of pursuing the life that would be under the law, but it doesn't have to be, which is why I said that earlier. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that way. But those who return in that way, they will be redeemed and given an opportunity to start over. Whether they intend to or not, whether they want to or not, they will be given an opportunity to start over, and then they can fail, and they can be wiped out again. <laughs> All right, that's the, that's what we're talking about here. So, in uh, in verse twenty eight. Uh, and those rebelling from what is good... Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention in verse 27, uh, that's the future tense there, that, that, that he describes this is something that will happen in the future. In verse 28, and those rebelling from what is good and sinners, you know, those who are doing evil like the Amalekites. Now, it doesn't say that in the, in the Hebrew, um, in, sen in the sense of the word for word. It's just that he... He picked a word to describe the sinners that was that was used exclusively for the Amalekites, <laughs> and and that was used for you know the foreigners, those people who are definitely uh, not going to subject themselves to the Mosaic law. So that's why I threw that in there. If you notice, the word for word translation does not have Amalekite in it, and and these other words because it's not there. But I put that in there in the thought for thought because that's what a person would be hearing if they heard if they heard that specific word that was used for sinner, the second one. You've got the first one in verse 28, and those rebelling from what is good, that's just a general word for those who are rebelling in the context of sin, who do belong there in a way. And then there are sinners uh, rebelling from what is good and sinners. It's that word that describes uh, those um, who would be foreigners who uh, and that, that word was, was, was used in conjunction with the Amalekites to talk about these people. The, uh, the study of the Amalekites is a very important one. Um, I have it on my list of things to do and hopefully I'll do that sometime. But it's a really, it really is an important one. It starts out with them being the people who, uh, who were keeping the Israelites from entering into the promised land. And there is a lot to be said about that and all the people who all the people and all the beliefs and uh, all the, uh, the obstacles that people struggle with to enter into the grace of God and then the new covenant. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle with Amalek. You know, it's a, it's a very, very, very worthwhile study. I hope I can get to it sometime soon. Uh, together are broken. Okay, everybody's broken. That's the end, of, uh, I'm sorry, that's the middle of verse 28. I'll read verse 28 again. And those rebelling from what is good and sinners... Those who are doing evil like the Amalekites, Amalekites, together are broken. And those who chose to live a life forsaking Hashem will be finished. How will they be finished? They will be finished living this life. All right. I mean, yes, they will be finished in the sense that He will kill them. But they're also going to be finished in the sense that their attempt to live in the life that they were living, that kind of life is going to be over. Now, there's a difference between the rebellious and the sinners. You know, those are the Amalekites and those are the Israelites. There's a difference between the two. And this is the time that I need to mention it. There are the rebellious, who are sinners, of course, but those are the ones who are living a life under the law, trying to restrain their flesh. Okay, those are the ones who are rebellious because they have failed to restrain their flesh. And then you've got the Amalekites, or the, you know, the absolute sinners, who live a life according to the indulgence of the flesh. Now both are evil. Although one may, you know, the, the, the ones who live their life trying to restrain their flesh compare themselves with the people who are living their life to indulge their flesh, and then they say that those who are living for the indulgence of the flesh are evil and so that they are good. You know, make yourself look good by stepping on somebody else. Right? I mean, you know, a religious person has to have somebody to compare themselves with. They need, you know, they need to be able to point out, well, see, I'm not a sinner like, like, like you. you know, they need to be able to do that. But they're still living uh, in rebellion because they are not, they're not obeying all of the commandments. And in the previous verses where the declaration is to make yourself clean, remember that word that was used exclusively in the Scriptures 
In Proverbs 20, verse 9, and also in Job twice, that I still didn't bring my references for, <coughs> to make yourself as perfect and as clean as God. And if you fail to do that, you're rebellious, and you'll be, de and you'll be destroyed <coughs> together with the Amalekites. All right, that's what he's conveying here. This is a completion of what he was saying previously. And you must be able to distinguish between the two, those who live for the restraint and those who live for the indulgence, so that you understand how they are going to be destroyed together. All right, together, regardless of, of who they are. Now, when, when Adam and Eve were removed from the Garden of Eden, there were two ways of life. There was one way of life, of righteousness, according to the restraint of the flesh. And there was another way of life, according to the indulgence of the flesh. One life with an acknowledgement of God, and another life with a rejection of God. But neither one of them worked out. Right? Neither, they were still out of the garden. Alright? They were still out of the garden. They were not in the Garden of Eden because they believed the satanic lie that all you need to know is what is good and evil and you can be a pretty good Christian. All right? It's the same satanic lie and it's outside of the Garden of Eden. There, is a cho there was a choice that was made to go and make their own gardens, to live their own lives, to build their own way of life that seems holy, that seems righteous, and they will go so far as to, as, to, as to raise their hands before God full of the blood of the offerings, you know, according to the law. They will go that far with desperation, as was explained previously, in order to show God that they are going to give it all they've got. They're, they're going to give it, you know, as much effort as is, as is necessary in order to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish that cannot, cannot be accomplished. These are the gardens that people live in. The garden of the restraint and the garden of indulgence. Either way, it's still the wrong garden. It's, it, you know, do you live according to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or do you live out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? In the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the life of the restraint of the flesh. Out of the tree into maybe uh, you know, a different tree. You know, the fig tree. You know, you're out there. Either way, you're still in the wrong tree. Okay? There is the tree of life that they no longer have access to. But it's still the wrong tree. It's only through the Messiah that we have access to the tree of life, and that's through His Holy Spirit. Alright, where was I? I was uh, in verse uh, 20, 28. I'll proceed into verse 29. Yeah, they will be finished. They will be finished in the sense that they will no longer be able to pursue their religion. Uh, in verse 29, For they will have shame from leaders whom you coveted and you have obtained... I put disgraced there. It should be disgraced. It's a cut and paste from the previous paragraph. Uh, that you have obtained disgrace from the gardens that you chose. Alright? The gardens that you chose. You have obtained disgrace. That's what he's talking about. You chose another garden besides the Garden of Eden. You chose the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. The garden of the law. And you have obtained disgrace. You're a disgrace because you're not obedient to God. Can you feel the pressure? Right? I mean, that was the, that was the message. You have obtained disgrace because you have not fulfilled the law's demands. You fail. So you have obtained disgrace. I'll go back up to the beginning of this. It says, For they will have shame from the leaders whom you coveted, and you have obtained disgrace from the gardens that you chose. To me, this is a, 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 a continuation of the previous verses where he was explaining that, uh, that there were parents and there were children, and the children experienced the consequences of the parents that there's a separation between the two. To me, there's a continuation here. The way that this is written, to say that someone else has obtained uh, shame because of what they did. They pursued the law in the way that they did, and then their children are now going to suffer the consequences from this. 
And another way that he exaggerates this point is by putting in between here, he puts in between this idea that from leaders whom you coveted, from leaders, he puts that right in between, in my opinion, in order to show that this is a generational consequence and that the children are going to experience the shame of the decisions of the parents, that the parents made these decisions and left them with this inheritance of this disaster, and that they're going to suffer the shame and the consequences for the, the decisions that the parents had made because of the leaders whom they have chosen. And of course you can review what I said last week about some of the decisions that people make that people have to deal with later on, future generations, and the Ponzi schemes that people deal with. Ponzi schemes and reverse inheritance, right? Yeah, that was two weeks ago. Well, or three. I don't remember. At any rate, <laughs> that's what he's talking about. He's putting a generational description here that the children are going, to are going to experience the consequences from what the parents decided from because of the leaders whom they chose. Now, subtly here, because of the words that he chose to use, what he's subtly stating is that this again is the end of the days of the kings. Remember how I started these messages with the days of the kings, that we are in the days of the kings. This is another place where he, he creates a, a delimiter between the beginning and the end, in this case of this chapter perhaps, creates a beginning and the end, where he's saying that this is the end of the days of the kings. When you all decided to go down this path to have these kings, these leaders whom you've chosen to get your new Garden of Eden going, it's not going to work out, and you're going to what you're going to get instead is disgrace, and everyone else who depended on you is going to be put to shame. Alright, so that's verse 29. <clears throat> and obtain disgrace in the garden you chose. Verse 30, for you will be like an oak fading as a leaf and a garden which has no water. Now that could be a terebinth tree. I still need to do some more research on that. I'm not sure really if it is an oak or a terebinth. The reason why I put oak is because I'm focusing more on the volume of wood. It's a little bit more volume of wood in the oak rather than the, than the terebinth. Because if you keep reading, <laughs> it's a good way to just brush by that, right? Just keep, just keep going. <laughs> okay. uh, if you keep going, and the strength and stored value will be for tinder, what, he, what he's expressing there is that the tree itself would have some stored value and that the wood, the volume of the wood, is going to decay to a point where it's no longer usable for the things that you normally would use it, is the way that it's been written. It's, it's, it, it's to say that, uh, that the wood cannot be used for lumber, that's one thing, and it is not likely that it's going to be very usable for firewood because of the lack of water that it has. Perhaps you've uh, encountered in the forest uh, or you've cut down a dead tree or something and it has turned into this real spongy material. You, have you ever encountered that when playing around with woods or trees or something? Get out, get out there in the forest and enjoy some nature a little bit more often, some of you. All right, and, and, and sometimes when it's just so dry, it, it, it has this segmentation to it where there's these little chunks and, and, and it just flakes off. You can't use it for firewood or for even uh, burning much of anything. And you definitely don't want to try to make something out of it uh, because it's got no water content left in it at all, it seems. That's the kind of description that he gives here. For you will be like an oak fading as a leaf and a garden which has no water, and the strength and stored value will be for tender in that sense. It will become something that will be of no use except for something that could be burned, but definitely isn't going to be as burnable in the way that you would have preferred you know, if it was well seasoned. That's the best way I can think of to describe this. But the tree, the tree that has strength, in the English translation that I have here in the New King James Version, he's speaking of the mighty men, I think is the way he said it, um, the strong will be as tender. In verse 31, gives the impression that he's talking about a person. I don't think that's the case. I think that he's talking about the strength or the value of the tree. Uh, that, 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 that would be the noun that would fit better with that verb. Uh, that he's talking about the tree that no longer has its preserved uh, value or the strength that it would have as an asset. 
uh, in other words. That's no longer going to be available for people. Like threads easily broken with a flame. The, 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 closest, or the, the closest passage that I could find that would give us a better idea of what this means is when Samson was bound with these wet uh, ties. Uh, he told Delilah that, uh, that if he was uh, bound with these wet strings or these wet ties, then, then, uh, then he would lose his strength and he could be overcome. And then he broke them, you know, like they were nothing. That's the word that Isaiah used here in the context of burning together or that they would be broken, uh, like they would be easily broken with a flame. Instead of being broken with Samson's strength, just put a little candle up to it or something and it will break like Samson would have, like Samson broke those ties that he was bound with. Okay, that was the word that Isaiah chose to use. Uh, like threads easily broken with a flame and his work all right, now this is a tough one. Will be something easily burned. And what is that something that is easily burned? I don't know. Uh, Isaiah used a word here that I have never seen used in any Hebraic literature ever. It's not in the scriptures. It's not in the Talmudic writings. I, I don't know where he got this word from. I don't know. I, I can't even find a root for it. I mean, this... This it has never been. It, I can't find the roots that was derived into another word. Even I mean, this, this he picked a word that must be slang or something. That's a bit. He maybe he made it up. I, I don't know. Or maybe I don't think it was a misspelling either. I think it really is spelled correctly. It's just that this word. I don't know what it is. All I can say is that it's something that can be easily burned. I can figure that much out. That's as far as I can get with that. Uh, something that is easily burned because he says if you keep reading, and they will both burn together. Okay, so that's as close as I can get. Whatever it is, it's going to be burned uh, together, and there will be no quenching of fire. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the works. Go back up to verse 29. For they will have shame from the leaders whom they coveted, and you, and, and, and you have obtained disgrace from the gardens that you chose. Right? We're talking about the works of righteousness according to the law, and the leaders whom they coveted, like the other leaders, the ways of the kings, hoping that they could improve, right? Improve on things. The same, similar temptation as Adam and Eve got. We can improve. You can be like God. There's an improvement mechanism here. It's a similar idea. And it's according to their works. And their works could be described or categorized with the assets that they are able to construct or grow. In this case, a tree is of great value, especially in a land filled with nothing but rocks. All right, and a few, a few, few shrubs here or there that could be of great value, which would demonstrate the quality of their work, the quality of their effort, but it's going to fade away like a leaf would fade away, and it's going to dry up is something that has no water, and their garden has no water. Can you get the sense of their works? It is a work of righteousness for which they, or from which they have failed. They have failed from their obedience. They have failed from their achievements, from the things that they would normally be able to boast in, those things that would give them their religious strength and their religious pride. All of that has passed away. It, it, is of no, it is of no value. It is of no functional benefit. It's something that is easily burned up and there will be no quenching with fire. And where have we heard this before? <sighs> so if you felt like I was a little rushed, this is why I'm running out of time and I wanted to get here. Okay? All that to get here. We heard this from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul partially quotes Isaiah, in my, in my opinion, in these verses right here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he speaks of wood, hay, and stubble, beginning in verse 11. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. He's talking about the New Covenant, that the Old Covenant was not a stable foundation that people could not build on because there's something wrong with us, not because there's something wrong with the law, but there is something wrong with us, that there needs to be a regeneration, there needs to be a resurrection. 
There needs to be a relationship with God. There needs to be a completely new way of life. A new way of refining. Uh, and, and the refining that we live by in, in, in growing and in maturing in Christ is a refinement of having the law stripped out of our lives. That is the dross that is to be taken out. Unless a person rejects his grace, then take that out. Either way, there's going to be a refinement. All right? That's what he's referring to. No other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In verse 12, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, of course, there is so much to be said about this. It's not a place to end. Usually it's a place to start. Yeah. <laughs> All right? I understand that. But... I'm picking it as a place to end in order to show you where I believe Isaiah was quoted. Uh, at the end of Isaiah chapter 1, speaking of the works that people were doing in the context of a work of righteousness, in addition to the work of indulgence, you know, the work of restraint and the work of indulgence. So also here, you know, there is a, there is a comparison between the work of God and the work of the, of the restraint. It's a comparison that's made. You know, there's, we, we hear about it this way. That people will say that those things you do for God out of your own effort will be uh, eradicated through fire. It'll be wood, hay, and stubble. Those things that are done, those works of righteousness that are done out of the energy of your flesh versus those things that God actually does within and through us. That is the silver and gold that will actually remain. That's what he's referring to here, in my opinion. And that there will be a salvation, but there will be a refinement. And that this is a final refinement in many ways. You know, when we finally end our life here, our flesh will become obsolete. And we will enter into a new way of life. And to me, there will be an ultimate refinement where salvation is finally realized in a unique way. And whatever, you know, whatever confusion or whatever uncertainty there was before, all of that will be gone. But in the meantime, in the meantime, there are other refinements that are happening. There's lots of dross that's take, being taken out of people's lives. There is the dross of removing grace when it shouldn't be there because a person wants the law. And there's the removal of law because it shouldn't be there when people want grace, when they want to know the Lord. And so he's using these minor refinement activities in order to reveal who he is to people. But yes, in the end, there will be an ultimate refinement when all of this will pass away, when we stand before him personally and we see him for who he is, and there will be no confusion or uncertainty. Okay, so with that, I will pause and continue into chapter 2 next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we could spend to review the Scriptures. And Lord, I, I do pray that through this uh, uh, accelerated presentation that you'll find some way to re remind us of things that, that, uh, that, was, that I was able to say and, and that you will speak to us concerning these things and, and show us more of who you are and what you're accomplishing. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>